Okay, well, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for um, coming back. Um, if you can believe it, this is our fourth session already. Four weeks have gone by, and uh, I don't know about you, but it's gone by pretty fast for me. So um, uh, I just really appreciate uh, you all coming on. And uh, every Tuesday, or as often as you can, or catching up on recordings, uh, it's been great. Um, let me just share my screen. And I want to uh, welcome um, uh, new folks. We have had um, more people sign up, especially as um, Father Patrick uh, gives a little plug at, at Mass on the weekend, and we get a, we get a few more who, who find uh, um, some interest in it. So welcome to you all. And if you are new, uh, just um, want to let you know that we are recording it. Um, as I said, it's, it, it's available for um, viewing afterwards uh, on our parish website, usually the day or two um, following the Tuesday evening. Um, but I still invite you to create a sacred space for yourself um, away from uh, distractions um, like cell phones and telephones and uh, you know other folks. Just make this a time for you. And we'll stay on, on mute just to avoid those background noises, but please feel free to come off if um, um, you know, just a couple of times I'll, you know, throw out a, a question or two and um, please feel free to come off and, and answer. Um, that would be wonderful um, to hear from you. Um, so as we um, always do, uh, we'll begin with prayer. And uh, let's just take a moment, though, to settle ourselves, our bodies, our hearts and our minds. And we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Creator of difficult people, we come together this evening with our own difficult people in mind. You know how difficult some people can be and how hard it is for us to love with your love sometimes. It is hard to respond with kindness when we are not being treated the way we should be. So Lord, we ask you this evening to bless us with the strength and the fortitude, the wisdom, and equanimity of spirit to deal with the difficult people you have placed in our lives. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, let's move these. And so this is um, where we, um, as we begin, just to kind of recap, um, you know, what uh, the week before, last week was uh, was surf, uh, suffering more at the personal level, and just want to open it up to any any um, thoughts, any uh, insights since the since you know during the week, if you had time to reflect, anything that came up for you. I had an email from somebody who said, what about, what about, um, you know, the, uh, the suffering of, of people around the world, the injustices, and uh, so she was already thinking forward, so that'll be, that'll be next week. Uh, Teresa, I have a phrase that um, pain and suffering uh, come into our life as a transformation. So a life change. I like that. And um, yeah, after my divorce, I just follow Jesus. And I think he's shaping me and she's making on me that that is she wants to be in me through the suffering. But I know he loves me and he's preparing my uh, spiritual life for transformation for better. That's right. That's so right. thank you. You're welcome. Susan says in our chat, uh, which you can always use as well, it was a rough 
a rough week. So under, understanding how my suffering can join that of Jesus uh, was perfect timing. You're welcome, Susan. All right. So uh, this, uh, this week we move into um, living and loving when people are difficult. And this past weekend's uh, second reading in particular and uh, Father Patrick's homily, uh, if you're from Padre Sarah and you heard it, um, really creates a, a wonderful bridge um, between our, our session from last week on suffering and our topic tonight on, on loving and living with difficult people. But if you didn't hear Father Patrick's um, homily or just uh, you know a little recap of it, um, he, was, he talked about the importance of an appropriate use of, of pain relievers. Uh, his example was, and I can completely relate, is dental work. Definitely need pain reliever when it comes to, uh, to dental work. Um, our, our, our physical bodies, you know, just uh, let's go easy on them and, uh, and use those pain relievers. Um, but on the other hand, pain cannot be avoided altogether. Um, and sometimes we try to do that, or we know people who try to do that uh, through various means. Um, addictions, of course, try to, um, you know, we use those to kind of lessen and, and deaden our pain, but, but we're really, you know, meant to experience pain. That's where the growth happens. Um, that's where, where God can use our suffering to show us the depths um, of his mercy and his love for us and to really offer a better way forward. And this can be true of our relationships. We know that relationships are the greatest source of our joy. I think about um, my, my children and especially my grandchildren. We, we find so much joy in, in the people that we surround ourselves with, but they can also be a great source of suffering for us. Um, so why, why be in relationships then? Why do we invest our time and our energy and our hearts only to be faced with suffering? Well, because relationships worth having require us, as Father Patrick said in his homily, to embrace pain and discomfort and selflessness for the sake of love. So... Tonight's title, um, I, I, I titled it Living and Loving When People Are Difficult. And I used it because um, we've all encountered difficult people at some point in our lives. And I'm fairly certain that no one would have logged on tonight had it been titled Living and Loving When I Am Difficult. Uh, I suspect that um, admitting our own difficulties uh, would not be um, as pleasing. Um, so really, maybe the title should have been or can be or the way we can look at it tonight is better to say that um, uh, to live in love when relationships are difficult. I think it's also important not to always label label somebody difficult, but they have difficult moments and they have, you know, um, they are not difficult people necessarily. But, but you know, when we're in a relationship with them, we all uh, have our ups and downs and uh, that makes it a challenge for us. Um, so, you know, in a nutshell, really relationships involve the connection between two or more people. And as we did with suffering uh, last week, tonight we'll begin with the ideal, um, the perfect, and then move to our reality, um, how we are experiencing it and how to address those difficulties so that we can work toward the ideal and as perfect as it can be in this life here on earth. Our former pastor, Father Dolan, once said that every plan we make is perfect until you introduce people, then anything can happen. Usually the plan goes right out the window. People, you can't live with them and you can't live without them. We are just naturally social beings and we're meant to be with each other in this life. And we can affirm this when we look at Genesis with the creation of the earth and all its inhabitants, including us as humans. And in chapter two, um, the creation of relationship. And we read, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And we know what happened. He created Eve and we have been together ever since. 
We were created and wired for interaction and with a desire for mutual and loving relationships, not isolation and loneliness. And from the beginning, God has been and is relation, relational. God wants to be in relationship with us. That's why he created us. And for us then to be in relationship with God and with others. And there's nothing more perfect than the Trinity as a model of love and relationship between God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus reveals for us that the Trinity is a community of persons in an eternal relationship of love. So let's start with the Father's love for his Son. In Mark 1.11, at Jesus' baptism, when he's coming up from out of the water, a voice comes down from heaven saying, You are my, my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. And then later at the Last Supper, as John 15 shares, Jesus said to his apostles, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And in these passages, we hear of the son's love for his father. In John 14, if you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the father, for the father is greater than I. And at the end of his earthly life, Jesus says, addressing God, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your son so that your son may glorify you. And finally, the third person in the Holy Trinity is the Holy Spirit, as the love that proceeds from the Father and the Son, bringing all life to the world. And after all that has happened to Jesus in his death and resurrection and his final teachings of the apostles, he must depart and return to his Father, but not without leaving us with the Holy Spirit. And he says in John 15, 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father, and he will testify to me. God came to us in the person of Jesus in that activity and that movement of the Holy Spirit is a, relation, is a reflection of their relational nature. So in this triune relationship of love, each has gifts, each has a role, and each points to one another and is focused on the good of the other. And since we are made in God's image and likeness, to share in God's life and love. We are made to follow in this way of being and relating. And we're made to love totally and sacrificially. So then the Trinity really can be a model for our relationships now. As the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are joined, we too are joined by relationship with our family and our friends, our siblings, coworkers, neighbors, and even in our daily encounters with others. And the Trinity also reminds us of our relationship with the larger world, with humanity. And like I said before, that's what we'll get into next week as we're connected to the larger world around us. But tonight, we're going to focus on the fact that we all have gifts and talents to share and roles to fulfill in our relationships. So when relationships work well, we're pointing to one another, we're lifting up the other, and we're focusing on the good of the other cheering of the other on when they succeed and consoling when we don't. But all this is easier said than done, right? We know too well that relationships don't always go like this. We live with people who can be difficult or work with people who can be difficult or reside next to people who are challenging. Maybe we socialize with people who can be difficult. or Maybe we're just related to people who are difficult. We may very well be the one who was difficult at any given time. If you're never ever difficult, I invite you to raise your hand now. So tonight I wanna to focus on um, uh, the two parts of the relationship. There's the I and then the other. And the other being the stranger, the customer, the driver next to us in traffic, the next door neighbor, the acquaintance, uh, the person that we usually share the pew with on Sundays, um, the friend from first grade or the friend from book club, a sister, an uncle, a spouse, uh, an adult child, the in-law, the elderly parent, you get the idea. But ultimately, we'll, we will focus on those relationships closest to us, the ones that we're willing to embrace pain and discomfort and selflessness for the sake of love. 
first we need to address the eye. I think it's always important to start with an inward look. So in his book, Dealing with Difficult People, Charles Keating offers this key uh, for coping with difficult people. He says, understanding ourselves and why we respond to people the way we do. In shorter words, know thyself, as Socrates said. Shortly before I started my master's program at St. John's Seminary, I had changed positions at the parish. I'd previously been in administration where I kind of thought I would be, where I had um, been mentored to be. Um, but I moved into um, the position that we, we titled Faith Life Minister. And as part of my journey into full-time ministry, uh, full-time pastoral ministry, I attended a program called Tending the Talents. And during this time, um, I took my very first personality assessment. And it was the DISC profile. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Um, but it stands for Dominance, Influence, Steadiness, and Conscientiousness. And this was very eye-opening for me. Um, I was not only able to put uh, language to um, what I knew about myself, um, but I was able to then understand um, those around me, those that I lived with, those I worked with, um, people I ministered alongside, my family. So having that knowledge, I was just like, I, I need to know more about myself. So I took um, some other assessments like um, Clifton's Strength Finders, um, the Five Love Languages, um, of course, the Myers-Briggs uh, personality assessment. And from these, I came to learn uh, more about myself, um, how I work, um, how I interact with people, uh, how I express love what I value, what my strengths and uh, what my weaknesses are. Uh, the DISC profile was not only helpful for me with my own self-knowledge, but it also helped me to identify others' um, profile. Um, you know, getting to know them, um, I can begin to see where they fit into that profile system. And um, from there, I could better understand them and the way they operate, their strengths, their um, weaknesses. And then I could, eventually begin to adapt and bend to create a successful relationship. And this proved very helpful um, with, with Father Patrick in his um, early days at Padre Serra. He had previously taken the DISC um, profile assessment. Um, and while we didn't, we didn't have any conflicts, but we just didn't know each other well enough. So as we got to know each other, um, we could look at our profiles together and um, see where we overlap, where we have commonalities, um, and then identify our differences and how we work best. And that was um, really helpful to develop strategies um, for working together, uh, especially as in this long haul. I discovered with DISC that I'm an introvert and all that that means. I could also identify um, the personalities of my husband, my children uh, and others around me, but it proved very helpful um, with my young adult um, children. I realized in looking back, reflecting back that when my oldest son would come home um, from school or work, he's an introvert, um, that he wasn't ignoring me by going to his room. He was simply going to, um, to take time to, to recharge his batteries after having been with people all day. So that was, you know, cause that caused, uh, you know, a little bit of conflict and, you know, why are you just, why are you coming in home and, and leaving me? Um, he, it wasn't that he didn't want to be with me. It's just he needed to recharge his batteries. And that was extremely helpful. And I can already tell um, in my grandchildren um, where they are and can um, begin to maybe anticipate how best to interact with them as they grow up. I would have to say that each baby is like their father. My granddaughter is an expert like her daddy and my grandson uh, is an introvert like his daddy, my son. My husband is more of an extrovert and he's a, a confident doer. He's the, uh, the one that um, is like, a, he's the first responder mentality where he, he's, he's ready to act. Um, but I take a little bit more time to act. I'm a little bit slower to process. I need more time to think and to, to make decisions. So in realizing that we can use those um, those strengths in certain situations. And when I did the five love languages, I learned how um, 
how I love, how I express love and how I prefer to have love um, expressed towards me. And this proved really helpful with my mother-in-law. Now we didn't have any difficulties or challenges, um, no real struggles, but I was always puzzled by the fact that in addition to birthdays and um, Christmas, she would always give us little gifts, little treats and cards for every holiday from January to December, Valentine's and Easter, even St. Patrick's Day and Halloween. And so having gone through the five languages, I could see that her love language is gift giving. She expresses her love by giving us these little gifts, these little tokens. And this allowed me to understand um, where she's coming from how best that she operates, um, and then how to have patience with her, and then really ultimately to appreciate it um, and her generosity. Because I know that that's filling her up in order to give to us. So you can see how self-awareness and knowledge um, of others' personalities as well can help in conflict. Um, kind of keep it at bay, but maybe not always, but it certainly provides um, an opportunity for us to grow in patience and acceptance. And yes, sometimes it means sacrificing our own comfort in order for someone else to succeed or shine. Um, a second important aspect of self is the ability to love ourselves. We can't give what we don't have. We have to be able to care for ourselves and nourish ourselves and be kind and compassionate with and forgiving of ourselves. And if we can practice these towards ourself, then we will find it easier, I believe, uh, to do for others. We know that we have moments when we're not our best selves, the times when we're less than kind and patient, uh, times when we're irritable and maybe even explosive. And if we can understand that about others as well, they have those moments too, we might just be able to approach their difficult moments with compassion. Another important aspect of understanding self um, that I've found is knowing our expectations. A while back, I read an article that said the cause of more marital trouble is unmet expectations. Generally, expectations are unmet because first we don't acknowledge them for ourselves, um, much less communicate them to those who are around us. My husband always reminds me that he is not a mind reader, even though I'd like him to be. Uh, oftentimes we expect those closest to us to know us so well that they obviously then know what we want, what we're thinking, uh, what we like, what we don't like, what we need, what we want to eat for dinner. It's just not going to, it's not always going to work that way. Um, but here's an example. A couple gets married and experience their first real difficult conflict as the holiday season approaches. The new wife expects that they will celebrate the holidays just as she had her whole life. And the new husband, in his mind, has the expectation that the holidays will be just as he grew up with. So you can see the rub where we bring in our expectations. Um, and if we don't communicate them, that's where the conflict arises. So communicating and talking our way through those things can help us reduce that conflict in those difficult moments. And... The other um, aspect of self uh, that I think is important is responsibility. I think it's key to successful relationships, uh, even with the most difficult people. Um, I must take responsibility for myself um, through my thoughts, my feelings, my actions, and my reactions. And while I can't choose another's attitudes um, towards me or how they treat me, I most certainly am responsible for how I react and respond to that. So now we're gonna to shift to, um, to the other, when the other is difficult. An article in Today's Catholic suggests that um, when we think about difficult people, there's two categories, those who are harmless and those who are dangerous. So I just wanna stay up front and make it clear that our God and our church would never want any person to remain in a relationship with someone who is dangerous, whether that is a spouse, a parent, a child, a relative friend, or another trusted person. Any form of, of, of danger through abuse or violence is never tolerable. And those people do not have a place in our lives. But the harmless ones, 
the people we encounter along our day, um, the ones who might annoy us, the stranger in the store or the doctor's office, the customer, the impatient driver, the annoying neighbor, the obnoxious acquaintance, or, or the judgy distant relative, um, or somebody that we know at, at church, maybe somebody um, in ministry with us. Either we're on the receiving end of, or we are witnessing their difficult behavior, and they can be grumpy or rude or curt, maybe just not as friendly as we had expected or hoped. Even in parish life, we encounter um, some, some people who fit that description. I must have been, this goes back a long time, um, I must have been lamenting about an encounter um, with someone who fit that description uh, to Father Dolan. Um, and he responded with something I, I won't ever forget. It's something that I remember um, to this day. He said that when people come to us with that demeanor, um, with those attitudes, they're likely bringing something heavy with them. It's not necessarily anything I did. Um, I'm just happened to be the next person that they see. And that kind of reminded me of our quote from last week, um, hurt people, hurt people. Uh, the difficult stranger that we meet along the way, um, uh, who we encounter in all of those places, um, perhaps they just had an accident or a flat tire. Um, they could have just come from the doctors where they received a, a terrible diagnosis. Maybe they just learned the death of a loved one or they've been let go from their job or maybe they're on their way to the ER where, where their spouse was just taken. Whatever it me, whatever it is, um, people can carry it with them to their next encounter, to the next person. And that next person just happens to get the brunt of it. Um, and this goes for, I mean, we can, we ourselves individually can do that as well. But the other people are those with whom we choose, or in some cases must be in relationship, our family and our friends. These two may very well at times be hurting people who lash out in anger and fear or stubbornness. Uh, maybe they're self-protecting or maybe they have uncommunicated, uncommunicated expectations themselves, um, but it makes them difficult to love. So right now, I want you just to take one minute just to, to think about a person who is the most difficult for you right now. Just get a picture of them, recall the difficulty with them. And now just hold them in your heart and mind for the remainder of the evening. Let's just assume from this point on that the difficult people in your life are the, are the chosen ones, um, that your relationship with them is worth having to embrace pain and discomfort and selflessness for the sake of your love for them. Charles Keating, uh, who I mentioned before, offered this perspective. Imagine the ocean, pick your favorite beach and stand on the shore. And just picture the froth that's brought up by the waves as they hit, as they hit your feet. Um, and then gaze your eyes up and look beyond to the wide open sea. You have two options. You can either focus on the froth which is the difficult people in your lives, or you can focus on the tranquil sea beyond. The sea beyond doesn't deny the frothiness, it knows it exists, but it helps us put it into perspective. So rather than be caught up in the froth, standing in it, dancing around to avoid it, we can put the situation into perspective by just gazing at the calmness of the ocean to see that bigger picture and where that perspective allows us to go is to, um, to think rationally and respond uh, maturely. Many teachers in the field of psychology and probably human resource management can provide all sorts of tools uh, for healthy conflict. I'm sure we've all been some, through some sort of training or um, you know, uh, ongoing education in healthy conflict. 
Um, perhaps you know them and you use them. But this evening, for our sake, we as gathered Christian disciples, we're going to look to our faith for guidance. And if we're to put on um, Christ and model Jesus' as teaching and behavior as we are called to do, then we should look to scripture for wisdom and best practices. Scripture is actually a treasure trove of practical ways of dealing with our difficult loved ones. You might be familiar with um, WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? Perhaps this is an overused cliche, um, but I really think it can be helpful. I know it's helped me in a few difficult times. First, I think it helps us call Jesus into the situation when we realize that we don't have to be alone in figuring this out. So we call to Jesus to mind and we affirm that we know that Jesus will have an answer for us, that he is the way to, um, to resolution. And it helps to actually put on the mind of Christ, put ourselves uh, in, in, his, in his thoughts, in his way of thinking. I think that um, what would Jesus do question also gives us an opportunity to slow down, to think through the situation rationally. And I think it also helps us to, to operate from love. When we are embodying Christ, it helps us to remember that he's about love and then we can operate from love. And we know through scripture that Jesus encountered his fair share of difficult people too along the way. Um, the Pharisees being a, a particular group, um, the native people in his, uh, or the people in his native land, as we heard in this past Sunday's gospel, um, individuals on his journey, uh, the apostles we know were challenging, especially Peter. Um, we all know that Peter was difficult, poor guy. Um, but he does give us hope, right? Because we can, we can <laughs> uh, relate to him. But as we stand on the shore looking out to the sea, we're going to begin um, with uh, and use these um, these suggestions um, for you. Uh, they're not necessarily a step-by-step -step order, um, but they are um, some ways that we can um, have that, look at that, that view of the sea with that bigger picture, with that perspective, um, instead of just sitting in, in, um, in the frothiness of the situation. So first and foremost, we need to remember the great command that Jesus gives us in Mark 12. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So you can see, you know, coming back to the point of, of loving ourselves, um, how important that is, and then to be able to extend love uh, to our neighbor, and in doing so, we are loving God. Uh, the second um, option uh, in, in dealing with difficult people is to pray. Um, we can pray for ourselves, for our own heart, um, asking God to soften our heart towards the other person, to keep anger and irritability at bay, and to use patience and kindness, and to understand their struggle. We should pray for them and ask God to work with them as well. Um, I really liked uh, Archbishop Gomez's um, article title um, from an article back in May. He said, becoming what we pray. And this really struck me as a different way of approaching prayer. Am I praying with negativity or am I praying with positivity? Kind of like, you know, we are what we eat. So you know, we are what we pray. And if we are praying for ourselves, if we are praying for the other um, and, you know, with that um, positiveness and with that hope, I think that'll take us in a better direction. And of course, um, praying for wisdom, asking the Holy Spirit to come upon us to provide the right words and guidance in dealing with our difficult person. Um, the third um, is to um, assess and think, um, who's being difficult? Is it just the other person or am I contributing to the problem? 
uh, am I the difficult person in this situation? Uh, what am I bringing to the table? And um, is there a hidden need on the, on the part of the other person? Uh, do I have a hidden need? Um, where, you know, where that rub is, where that clash is, what's, what's going on in that moment? Um, and we can also ask ourselves, could this be a situation to just simply ignore? Um, we see in Luke 4, when Jesus went back to his hometown, um, and he upset the people of Nazareth, so much so that they wanted to throw him off the cliff. But what does Jesus do? He ignores them. He passes through the midst of them and walks away. Sometimes, oftentimes, people are just throwing tantrums, um, maybe to seek a reaction, maybe just to pick a fight. Um, could that be the situation that's going on? Um, and, you know, we don't have to accept every um, invitation to fight that we receive. Um, I think about... Um, You know, when, when you think about throwing tantrums and toddlers and, and what, um, you know, what are they really communicating? Um, you know, are they really uh, communicating a need? Are they communicating, uh, you know, uh, a real upset? Um, so I think it's, it's important for us to, to look at um, really what the situation warrants. Um, I know oftentimes on, I think that social media, we can get into um, into arguments, into um, really nasty um, altercations, um, just to get people's reactions. Um, but we don't necessarily have to go there. So as we assess the situation um, to determine what the needs are. And then um, we can question. Um, Jesus asked a lot of questions, uh, if, if you'll notice um, in his uh, dealings with people. Oftentimes when he is asked a question, he turns around and responds with his own questions. They can, you know, they're either rhetorical um, or they're challenging or they're simply just to get more information. And re rather than replying with an answer or a lecture or judgment, asking a question tells the other person that we're open to dialogue, that we want to um, understand more and learn more about what's going on with them. And then of course, listen, listen, listen. If we're going to ask questions, we need to be ready to listen and really listen. And not just in order to respond, you know, as they're talking, we're formulating a response, um, but listen to the other side, um, to their viewpoint and how they're looking at things. In all of my um, pastoral studies, the number one best practice in pastoral care is in fact listening. And, um, and it's not just to the words, they can be helpful, but we listen um, with our eyes um, and we look at their, um, at their body language. We listen for, to the tone of their words. Uh, sometimes the very act of talking can just release the tension and it can diffuse the situation. And it can soften us. I've experienced it personally, being so frustrated, so upset that just by saying those very words that have been sitting in my, in my brain, festering in there, um, it just really, it can release the tension. Um, and I've seen it with, um, with coworkers and, and people I've encountered. Um, really oftentimes they'll just come to their own conclusion and solution just by being able to talk it out and having somebody to listen with not necessarily the intent of having an answer for them. Uh, James 119 offers this, know this, my dear brothers, everyone should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of a man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. We can also um, use silence. Proverbs 17 offers these words of advice. Those who spare their words are truly knowledgeable and those who are discreet are intelligent. Knowing when to speak uh, and when to keep quiet can go a long way. Jesus also took care uh, not to be um, cornered. Uh, he didn't allow himself to be trapped or guilted into anything. Um, silence can allow us to gather our, our thoughts and our words 
um, rather than respond or react with anger and judgment, um, defensiveness, or even snark. Ephesians 4.29 um, gives us this advice. No foul language should come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for needed edification, that it may impart grace to those who hear. And in Ecclesiastes 7, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Better is a patient spirit than a lofty one. Do not let anger upset your spirit, for anger lodges in the bosom of a fool. Another um, approach to dealing with difficult people um, is to be flexible. Jesus changed his mind. In Matthew 15, we have the story of the Canaanite woman who demands that Jesus heal her daughter. And at first he's, he's reluctant, but then he is changed by seeing the greatness of her faith and her um, persistence. So for us, what would happen if we, rather than standing our ground, insisting that we're right, we ask for the other person's input. Could it be possible that the other person has a valid opinion, a point, or an idea? And what would be so bad if we broadened our view and considered another way from their viewpoint? Another um, uh, way of dealing with with people when they're being difficult is just to simply be kind. No other person needs kindness more than someone who is experiencing difficulty. This is the time to act as Jesus would, to be especially kind to that person and offer that person some service while looking at him, looking at God in him, in that person and loving God in him despite his fault. True charity, the charity that Jesus demands of us, makes no distinction of persons, but has equal love for all, because we see and love only God, or should see and only love God and all people. We love them precisely because God does, and we love them for God, and we love God in them. Yeah, it's hard, but by calling on his grace, he will grant it. And St. Therese says it this way. When I show charity towards others, I know that is you, God, who are acting in me. Perhaps you've heard this story before. A little girl has trouble falling asleep. So her mother reads her a story. And then she reads her another story. And after that, another story. And mom says, now it's time to go to sleep. And the little girl replies, but I want you to stay here. Mom says, no, no more stories. It's time to go to sleep. To which the little girl responds, I want daddy. Which means, I take it, this isn't working on mom, so let's try dad. Well, daddy still is at work, so there's no possibility that he's going to read another story to the, to the little girl that night. So she, the little girl tries a different tact. She says, I want to stay right here, mommy. And mommy says, I'll just be right there in the other room. And the daughter says, but I don't want to be alone. And the little, and the uh, mom says, but Jesus will be with you closer than I am. He's always with you. And to this, the little girl replied, but I want Jesus with skin on. Could it be that our difficult people just want us to be with them, to hold them, to show them kindness and love and be Jesus with skin? I'm sure that there's so many more um, uh, ways of dealing with difficult people. Those are the ones I narrowed in on tonight. And the last one I want to, um, uh, to go into is um, forgiveness. We may have thought that um, we would skip over this one, but we know that every relationship that is worth embracing pain and discomfort and selflessness for the sake of love is going to at some time or another require forgiveness. God willing, we've come to a place of resolution or an agreement to disagree, um, and now it's time to forgive. And how many times are we to forgive? In Matthew's gospel, we have the parable of the unforgiving servant 
when Peter approaches Jesus and asks him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times, we know Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. I think we can never exhaust the learning about forgiveness. It's one of those faith subjects that we continuously need to hear about and be reminded about. In his book, um, a new book, as a matter of fact, Here Comes Life, Father Jim Clark dedicates a whole chapter to the topic, and he discusses what it is and what it isn't. These may all be familiar to you, but again, I think they're a good reminder. Forgiveness is not approval of the other's behavior or actions. Forgiveness is not weakness. In fact, it's a sign of incredible strength because we've done the work and decided to move forward. Forgiveness is not forgetting. And sometimes um, there are actually moments where we can learn a lesson. And so by remembering and not forgetting it and taking it forward with us, we um, inform ourselves on how to act maybe in a similar situation in the future uh, or think, think through something um, before we even you know, make a decision. Um, forgiveness is not uh, an agreement. Um, quite often the other person um, doesn't even realize they wronged you or maybe um, they don't realize that they hurt you as deeply or maybe they do um, and they're just not uh, in a place of, uh, of being in a good relationship with you and um, they don't know that you're forgiving them. They don't need your forgiveness. But in any case, um, it, just, it, only requires, it only requires us. So what forgiveness is, as Father Jim says in his book, um, it means to let go in order to live in the present moment. And I really appreciated that, um, that description, uh, that definition, because when we don't forgive, we can remain stuck in the situation. We can remain um, standing in that frothiness on, on the ocean. Um, we can have one foot in the past um, while trying to catch up to the present and never really be fully present, much less look to the future with the other foot. He goes on to say that forgiveness is an act of the will. Forgiveness is a choice and it's a decision to actually let go of the hurt. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, have a, um, a physical experience of, of forgiveness. So just for a moment, I want you to sit um, quietly and take a deep breath. Hold it as long as you can. Feel the tightness and the tension and the stuckness that holds your body, that grips your body. Now let the breath go and experience the flow of life once more. That is what the act of forgiveness can feel like in our spirit. Father Jim goes on to say that forgiveness is a gift to ourselves and then secondarily to the other person. Um, you know that adage, uh, forgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. Father Murray Bodo says that until we learn to forgive deeply and sincerely, we remain only on the threshold of real union with God. We remain essentially imprisoned and unfree. In the course of a lifetime, we gradually accumulate countless little resentments, which if allowed to grow, become big hates and seemingly insoluble differences. But when we choose to forgive, he goes on to say, we purify our hearts and we enter into the mystery of love and the mystery of God. And as God is a mystery, as suffering is a mystery, people and relationships can also be a mystery to us. But we have the Trinity as a model of relationship. When we operate together with God, each of us living from our strengths, in our gifts, and our talents, when we learn how to negotiate those challenges and difficulties, 
and each of us is willing to embrace some pain and discomfort and selflessness, we will have a firm foundation like the stool uh, in this, in this, on the screen. Um, we've got the three, um, the three legs of, of the stool that provides that firm foundation from which love or charity uh, will flow. And if you can believe that is um, what I have for tonight. Um, and I'll just give um, you a moment if you have any, any thoughts or questions, any insights, any words of wisdom for all of us, any, uh, anything that works for you. Feel free to come I just up. have one observation. Um, you know, sometimes you mentioned about the different types of personality inventories uh, that people take. And sometimes I feel that we paint ourselves in a box when we rely too heavily on those types of personal inventories because it doesn't allow us to grow. It doesn't really allow the Holy Spirit to work and take us and challenge us to do new things that we may have to not rely on our personal talents, but to really uh, rely on the spirit's uh, strength to get us through and to do that new challenge that we're faced with. Oh, you are so right, Barb. You're right. We can, we could put ourselves in a box. We get our, just our, our self description and, and keep ourselves there. Um, I know, I mean, as an introvert, I could, you know, totally just live how an introvert prefers to, but that's not going to, that's not going to give me anything. Um, uh, more than what I experience. It's not going to stretch me. It's not going to. So we do find where those moments um, that, um, you know, we, we have to live outside of our, of our personality, our comfort zone. And, um, and like, just like suffering, um, the suffering, uh, you know, our personal suffering that we talked about last week, um, the, um, the suffering and the difficulties that we experience with other people, it's in that where we, where we do grow. So when we take ourselves out of comfort zones um, and uh, uh, you know, that's when the growth happens. You're so right, Barb. Teresa? Yes. Um, well, I think we can all agree in his day, Jesus was probably labeled as difficult. Oh, sure. Not a people, right? <laughs> sure. And, and what I think what the people at that time didn't realize is they were being triggered. And what I love about our young people today is the word triggered is part of their language that they use. Our 20-somethings and 30-somethings, you'll hear that all the time. Oh, you're triggering me. Mm -hmm. And we were never given, and I'll put myself, I'll just say we as myself, I guess I won't include everybody in this, I guess, <laughs> the, language, the language to say, why am I being triggered by this? Mm -hmm. It's time for me to self-reflect because what is it that, like you said before, I mean, you mentioned this, obviously, you know, where am I participating in this and why am I participating and feeling the way I do? But it, it's so important not to abandon ourselves too, because, you know, we, we have values and um, we have boundaries and people are uncomfortable when we set those boundaries and it's unfortunate, but if we had the language to say, you know what, I, I hear you, I'm listening, but this is not okay with me. Oh. And we have to be able to accept that people will say, that's not okay with them. We have to say, okay, well, if the relationship's really worth it, what can I do? Where can we meet in the middle? What, how, how can we fix this? How can we get to yes? And I don't think we go there. Instead, we're like, too busy reacting instead of responding. Oh. So, but if I think if we reflect on, you know, Jesus was called difficult and it's okay. It's sometimes if you're called difficult, maybe it's just because you're standing up for yourself. Very true. Very true. That could be part of the, the assessing. Yeah. Am I the difficult one? Is this person have, you know, are they, are they um, really making a good point? Are they standing up for themselves? Thanks, Linda. One of, the, one of the things I've learned and has helped me tremendously when dealing with difficult people is a, a very famous phrase from Richard Rohr, which says, if you don't transform your pain, you transmit it. Yeah. And when I come across somebody who's there, they're coming at me with some harsh words or 
something hurtful or something that's frustrating, instead of taking it on personally right away, I'll kind of think of those words and think that might be coming from some pain within them and that they may not even realize it. And it's really not about me. It's about them. And whatever pain they've had, they haven't done the work to transform it or understand it. And so then it comes out at the people they're with. Uh And to make that distinction, as well as Linda's made a really good point, as well as looking inside me, why, why is that bothering me? And if I look at both of those together, usually there can be some sort of resolution within, within my way of thinking and acting. Yeah. yeah. I know what an opportunity to, to not take it personally and to realize that it could be, uh, you know, a hurting person lashing out, you know, and, and reacting and what an opportunity to, to treat them with, with God's love and uh, care and compassion. Difficult, but it's an opportunity. It might just change their, their day, their moment. Can you just repeat the quote that you said about forgiveness? Um, you started with forgiveness is for ourselves. And then there was this really cool quote that you said. Oh, yeah, yeah. So forgiveness is a gift to ourselves. And um, uh, Father Murray says that until we learn to forgive deeply and sincerely, we remain only on the threshold of real union with God. We remain essentially imprisoned and unfree. And there was something else after that. In the course of a lifetime, we gradually accumulate countless little resentments, which if allowed to grow, become big hates and seemingly insoluble indifferences. But when we choose to forgive, he says that we purify our hearts that allows us then to enter into the mystery of love and the mystery of God. Teresa, I have a question and I'm curious to see if anybody has feedback on this. Do you think you can still be kind and still be labeled as difficult? (laughs) <laughs> still be kind and still be difficult. Yes. Well, you know, be others would still label see you, you as being difficult. But oh, sure. See, I think, I think so, so many conflicts start in delivery. I think, you know, when we, when we come off as, um, you know, we, we very well could be right or we could, you know, but when we, how we approach the, the situation, the words we use, the tone we use, the attitude, I, I think the delivery can can make or break a situation. And so to always come from a place of of kindness um, with a with a calmness, um, you know, will go much farther than um, you know, because we, we do have to challenge people, you know. Um, we do have to uh, stand for what's right, but it's I think it's the delivery. Father Craig Boyle always talks about that, Mm -hmm. you know, that you, you gotta be difficult, but you can use your kindness. Like he used the image, (laughs) my name, Rose, (laughs) Rose, to have, you know, like the thorns, but you have that, the end result is the beauty. So you're, you're constantly being reshaped by God and, and, and it's also constantly through others mm-hmm. and that you can also help refine others as well. It's that symbiotic relationship. There's a quote I remember from Wayne Dyer. He said about speaking of kindness, he says, if you have the choice to be right or to be kind, always choose being kind. Yeah, That's a good one. I would have some challenge with that because I think where there's an issue of justice involved, whether it's justice in the church or in our society, 
uh, there is a time that we can't just, you know, pretend that doesn't exist because then we're only given credence to the injustice. And I think that has to be something in our discernment within our conscience to say, I can't be silent in from telling the reality of what the issue of justice is. And that may not always be kind to the person who maybe is trying to uh, gain control, have control over other people or other systems in our society or in our church. And so I think uh, that word of justice needs to be evaluated in our discernment. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, I think the whole maybe kindness is, if you look at love, because the source of everything is love. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to challenge that love. Like I said, Father Craig Boyle or uh, with the homeboys or uh, Father Chris Panette or any of these different various groups like Jella has worked with and Gary is that you can be challenged, but the source has to be of love. You can be difficult, but in social justice, always the source is out of love, I believe. Because Jesus is love. Um, Susan put in the chat, she says, you can be kind and create boundaries. Boundaries can seem difficult to people, um, but they are healthy. You're right. Thank you, Susan. Um, a few years ago, Father Jim Clark uh, came out to the parish to uh, meet with our pastoring team on the topic of evangelization. And he said, um, some of you have heard me say this, or maybe have even heard him say this, that um, a model of, of evangelization that is not working, is not going to work in this day, is um, that first people have to behave and then believe, and then they can belong. And he said, we need to flip it and, and turn it on its heels and allow people um, to be welcome to, so, to feel that they belong and then they can believe and then they will behave. Um, so I think about, you know, um, you know, when, when people come to us, um, you know, and, and they're, you know, full of, of all sorts of hurts and anger and issues, you know, like Pope Francis says, we're not going to attend, you know, to their to their blood pressure, or we might attend to their blood pressure, but you know, they're, we're not going to do a physical for their healthiness. We're going to do, we're going to triage and we're going to take care of the wounds. We're going to take care of the pain, um, you know, and because we, we want them to feel like they belong here, that they are valued, that they are loved. And we're going to give them that love and kindness. Um, even though we might say some pretty challenging things to them, um, you know, and then from there, they will see God's love, hopefully, and experience God's love hopefully through us so that then um, they will change their behavior. They will, um, you know, conform their life to, to God's will for them. But if we come in, like, like, uh, as my mom always said, a bull in a China shop, we're not going to get very far. I love this kind of discussion. You guys had some great insights. It's an interesting observation you made about, you know, the sort of flipping the model, but we see the bishops now, they're going to have that three-year Eucharistic revival. And is that more going to be more doctrinal sort of ideas? Or it seems like a real step back from really listening to the needs and the challenges. Like you were saying, we triage people where their needs are instead of going to the doctrinal, but they seem to have flipped it back to that. And I think that's, um, to me, is sort of a challenge as we look at those kind of initiatives coming from the USCCB. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final, any final thoughts before we close in prayer?
I have one. Um, so getting back to the difficult and kind and saying difficult things with kindness, we can only control how we present things and how we interact, but we don't have control over the other person's perspective, which is their reality. Right. So there's always that chance that no matter how much love we speak something with and how much kindness, it's not going to be perceived in that way. So true. Thank you for that reminder, Lisa, for sure. And so that that's, thank you, Lisa, because that's exactly what my point was. And I, that validation is so helpful to me because that's how I respond. But at the same time, it, you're you're thinking, well, this relationship is so important to me that obviously I want to work on it. But then there are people who don't want to be on, don't want to, the relationship's not as equal to them. So that's when we can't take it personally. That's because we over-personalize everything and feel attacked. And then that's when we go, Rah! you know, yeah. now I'm hurt. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm in that discomfort. Yeah. Instead yeah. of sitting with the discomfort saying, ouch, you know, okay, I'll walk away, breathe. This hurts. Let them have their space. And we take the time to let it unfold on its own. We're always so like ready to go into the ring and battle it out when we should just be like, Let's just let it unfold, see where it goes on its own, and then go to prayer. But the other person may not be praying about it. The other person may be just saying, you know what? Forget it. I'm done. Very true. We have, to be, we have to be welcoming that that's if if it's meant to be, it will be. I don't know. That's a good point. In that assessment, yeah. Is it something that we can, you know, um, ignore? Or is it something that... Um, we, yeah, we have to face the reality that maybe that is that is going to be a point of departure um, with, with somebody, you know, uh, so true. And in, in, in this last 15, 16 months, the, the climate of, of uh, the division that we've seen, uh, the disagreements that we've seen, the, the um, um, differing opinions, you know, we automatically sometimes kind of just discount somebody, uh, you know, and, and, and we have to look at levels of friendship, I think, you know, um, and relationship, especially friendship. I mean, family, you kind of, you know, a spouse, you know, that's a whole other, a whole other thing. But if you look, if you look at friends, the people that we choose to have in our lives, yeah, those are some, that's some, some um, discernment we need to do. Well, it's kind of like what you said earlier that you first have to look at yourself first. Yeah. You know, yeah. start from there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I think I think we can't discount the fact that we could be the person who's difficult. And, and I think that's what you all were saying from the very, you know, from the beginning, that first point was that um, what we're saying could be uh, difficult for others. It's not um, as much as I would like to think black and white. Uh, it's all it's all gray and um, messy. Um, and but you know that's really where the the work comes in. Are we really are we willing to um, discern and pray and put in the work um, and have those conversations? Well, thank you. So next week, um, sorry here. Uh, our topic is living um, in a in a secular, anxious world, and uh, and how we do that as Christian disciples. And for our new folks, um, a session evaluation just to uh, bring you up to speed. This um, six week project is part of my integration project for my master's program. 
And uh, so for my um, integration paper, I'm looking for feedback and evaluation of the sessions and how they impact your, your, your life and faith if they do at all. Um, uh, so those will be coming um, each week after, we, um, after each session. And I appreciate any participation, um, the more feedback, uh, uh, the better. I have, you know, material to work with. So, um, so then we will we will close with prayer, and I um, just invite you all to um, pray this aloud with me uh, as we close out our evening. Father, I have to thank you for looking beyond my faults and for loving me unconditionally. Forgive me when I fail to love others in the same way. Give me eyes to see the needs of the difficult people in my life and show me how to meet those needs in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week, if not around the parish. Thank you, Teresa. Good night. Good night.